Hello, my name is Eileen DeFriest and welcome back to my channel. It's great to have you. Please be sure to subscribe to my channel and turn on your notifications and also follow me on Instagram, please. Today I'm going to talk about something that's a little difficult to talk about. And in fact, I'm going to be talking about a few things on my channel that are quite difficult to talk about. So what I'd like to talk about today is drug dependency, drug addiction. So I spent most of my life not dependent on anything. And I thought I was one of the lucky ones, you know, that I just didn't have a dependent personality, an addictive personality. Well, you'd be surprised what can happen in a life. Things can change before you know it. Uh, behavior has changed and you start taking something. And before you know it, that something starts to rule your life. And that's exactly what happened in my life. Well, I'm going to tell you my story now. And it's me sharing a very big part of my life, roughly 10 years, I'm 61, roughly one sixth of my life was spent in service to addiction. So this is what happened. Around roughly 2004, I moved from New York City to Los Angeles to continue looking for work as a technical writer. But before I did move to California, I was staying with a friend and he introduced me to a sleep medication. Uh, I don't remember how it was very innocent and was just a very genuine, you know, here's a sleep medication if you're having trouble sleeping. So it was called so I took it and I took it a couple of times and it made me feel really kind of bizarre, really kind of out there. It's a class of drugs called hypnotic and that's exactly what they are. They sort of hypnotize you. It wasn't like any drug I'd ever taken. I'd never been attracted to drugs that make you really lose, you know, focus. And I'd never been attracted to excessive drinking that could make you lose focus or control. But this drug somehow, it made me feel kind of soothed. And it just sort of put my mind into a different space. In any event, it helped me sleep, and I didn't think much about it. Then some months later, I was having trouble sleeping, and I asked my friend again for medication, and he gave it to me. And I again fell asleep and thought, wow, that was really, really smooth and easy, and it made me feel kind of zoned out and good. I found that I really enjoyed the way it made me feel. It made me feel just removed from the natural anxiety that I was feeling. So I became receptive to this sleep medication while I was still in New York. And then I moved to California in 2004. And while I loved California, it was really beautiful. I found that I became more and more dependent on this medication. I got a prescription for it. It was very easy to do. I just asked my doctor for one. And I started taking it a few times a week. And then slowly I started taking it every day for sleeping. And like a lot of things, when one takes a hypnotic to sleep, you're basically training your body not to fall asleep on its own, but to need a catalyst to help you sleep. That's the, the really dark magic of drugs like this. And doctors are quite aware that these things should only be taken in the short term. But with a lot of American medicine, I was left to my own devices. You know, I asked for the prescription and I would get it. So I was able to abuse it freely, really. And, and that's no one's fault but my own. And the fact that I didn't have access to a lot of awareness about the medication. So I, uh, I was starting to become dependent on the sleep medication, dependent on its ability to put me to sleep when I felt like going to sleep. Sadly, I didn't regulate what I was taking. I allowed myself without any real consciousness to become, uh, literally to give over my ability to sleep to something outside myself, a pill. In part because it was easy to do, I was lonely, I felt my life when I moved to California, though I loved it. It was paradise. I didn't know anybody out there. The only people I knew were the, my colleagues, my co-workers. When I moved to California, I took a rental apartment, quite an expensive one, actually, more expensive than I, than I should have. So I had a home, but it was a home without much furniture. It was really, really very nice, but it was you know, very, very lonely. So I'd get up early and go to work each day and I'd come home. And since I had no one waiting for me, no pets or anything, and certainly no friends and no partner, I would often work late and then drive home. And then I would, you know, get ready for 
bed, you know, watch TV, shower, and all that. Then I would look forward to taking the medication. I would take the medication. I would stay up for a little while and get on the computer and just sort of zone out. It was this medication that just, for some reason, it kind of fit me like a glove. What I liked about it was it just sort of created an environment where I didn't have anxiety and where I could just sort of let my mind go free, whether it was online or in reading or just sitting there listening to music. It just made me feel peaceful. And now listen, this was a sleep medication. It's not supposed to do that. A person isn't supposed to take it so they feel less depressed. And I was on antidepressant medication. I was on Prozac at that stage, but I was also needing more. And the more that I needed, I was getting from sleep medication and my new pattern of abusing it. So I would take it at night and, um, you know, and then go to sleep. And for the most part, I would sleep through the night, but not, not always. So, you know, this went on for a couple of years and I was getting more work in Southern California and in Los Angeles. So I stayed and then the work started to slow down. And that was a bit troubling. I couldn't afford the apartment I was in any longer, so I had to get a studio. And so I got a lesser apartment in a not great area. So it was very depressing. Um, but I still had some work. And some of it I could do at home, which lessened the commute. But it was still a very stressful time for me. And then at night, you know, night would come. Sometimes I would go out, but not that often. And I was just... You know, at a time when I should have been spreading my wings socially, you know, getting to know people, planting seeds, if this is where I wanted to be, I needed to establish a network. But the thing was, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't reach out to people. I didn't try to make friends. And that's a closing down of one's life that isn't healthy, you know, and I can talk about this in, you know, in retrospect, but I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know that I was taking all these steps to basically build a fort around myself of, you know, myself and my, my drugs, you know, my medications. But that's what I was doing, and it was very, very unhealthy. So work started to, to be problematic in that the contracts weren't flowing as much, and I was having some trouble financially making ends meet. But I still got the medication, though. I still got the medication, and I still was able to get this prescription. Oh, and by this stage, I was doing that thing that, that addicts do. And that was going to one doctor to get a medication, you know, a prescription for a month, going to another doctor to get a prescription for a month. So I was, you know, I was set up, you know, I had my doctors to go to and everything. I think roughly around this stage, I started to take the medication every night. And it mostly helped me to sleep through the night, but not always. And when it didn't, I would take another half. You know, it became my partner. It became my wife. It became everything to me that... If I had any issue of, of the drug running out, oh, it would really freak me out. You know, I would arrange everything so that I could get this medication. And if I couldn't get it, I would go to an emergency room in a hospital. And I would say, you know, I feel terrible. I can't sleep. I've been up for days. So I would do whatever was necessary to get this medication, whatever was necessary. And, um, you know, that's addiction. That's real addiction. And I didn't, still didn't know it at that stage. All I knew was that I liked taking the sleep medication and I was fully involved in my own little planet of alienation. And I liked it. And that's the sad thing is I really liked it. I wanted to be there. It was like this drive to, to sort of disappear. It was terrible. And then sometimes I started taking it during the day. And now that was the real crossover for me, is when day became night, literally. And that is a real sign of something is wrong. I should have seen that that was really, really bad to do, but I didn't. I think I numbed myself so much so that I was afraid that I, if I felt anything, it would be the end of me. And this was, you know, a few years into my dependency now. So I started taking it during the day, and that just escalated things. And then I was taking double dose at night. So I was taking 20 milligrams of the medication at night and then taking one pill during the day. And I remember one night, oh, I remember talking to a friend of mine. I was staying at a hotel at this stage. There was a point where I lost my apartment and I was staying in, in an inexpensive hotel. Actually, I was staying in a very nice hotel and then I couldn't afford any more. So I, um, I used a credit card to get this very nice hotel. 
and I never paid the credit card back. Uh, so I had to go to a lesser hotel and use a different credit card. So I was living in this hotel. It was about $100 a night, which isn't cheap. But um, I was working to try to just sustain a roof over my head and my ability to buy the medications. But one night when I was in this posh hotel, I remember talking to a friend of mine in New York. I had taken pill after pill. I wasn't trying to kill myself or hurt myself, but I was trying to feel the drug and I couldn't feel it. So I remember telling her I took about 10 of them, not at once. It wasn't in any way a, a cry out for help or a plea in any way at all. But what it was, was me just trying to, trying to have it kick in so that I wouldn't feel anxious or upset, but it wasn't working. And I remember telling her I've taken about 10 pills and she just almost couldn't believe it. But it was the truth. Oh, and by the way, by this time I was ordering medication from India. Um, I tried Canada, that didn't work. But India would be happy to send you whatever you want, pretty much. I would order the drugs in bulk and I would get them shipped to me. Sometimes it would take a bit of time, but usually, you know, a couple of weeks. And I was living in this less expensive hotel, but still, you know, costly. And I was working. I had a contract that lasted about a month and I was still commuting. By this time, I was using a rental car. I didn't own a car. It was a terrible decline and, and I didn't see it. I was just living it. It was a nightmare. So I was just hanging on by a thread. And then... Um, I went to the doctor and I said something about it, uh, telling my doctor that I had really had bad anxiety. And she ended up prescribing diazepam or a, one of the drugs in that class. And I started taking that and very quickly became addicted to that too. So mine became a dual dependency. And I had what anyone could see was a dual diagnosis. I was depressed and I had drug dependency. Um, but I wasn't close enough to anyone, literally anyone at this time, who could see that this was happening. I created this path in life where nobody could trouble me. And while I, when I was younger, when there was a lot going on with my mother's illness, my father was working two and three jobs, you know, I was left on my own a lot. You know, I was left to my own devices. Now I don't, you know, I don't think that's a bad thing. Sometimes that's what happens when a parent is sick and the other parent has to work their, you know, their head off just to keep us, you know, to keep a family above water. Um, but I did get lost in the shuffle and I didn't always know what to do with myself. And I think a lot of the way I behaved at this time was the same way I might have, you know, acted as an adolescent, which is that I just didn't have much direction. I didn't have enough self-esteem to say, Eileen, you were just ruining yourself here. But I didn't say that because I didn't know to say that. Hello, just wifers, how are you, baby? And before you know it, I was taking just a terrible cocktail of medications that really made for a kind of peaceful withdrawal from the world. Now, that might feel good, and that's the thing that's really troubling about addictions, is the thing that you're addicted to may feel good. It's not a good thing, because what it does is it, it, it makes one withdraw from life. It makes one not feel anymore. And feelings are the kind of things that we need to keep us alert. We need to know what the dangers are in the world. We can't just sleep through life. And that's what it was making me do. I lost in total about 10 years to drug dependency. Now that's 10 years I'll never get back. And I remember almost everything, but I was so medicated that I didn't care. Now, when you're coming off medication, and I'll tell you how I came off it, when you're coming off medication, it's very hard to think of what else in life makes you feel as good as that medication made you feel. And that's how I felt about this medication. It was all I wanted. And that's what was kind of hard to describe to my therapist was, you know, the sad thing is, and this is from a couple of years ago when I was speaking to her about it, I said to her, you know, the thing is, I kind of want to be back in that place. And I said to her, I said, it's always going to gnaw at me. It will always be a kind of what if situation for me, that there's always that state to achieve. Well, I no longer feel that way. Now, it took me a long time to get to the point where, no, I want to feel everything. I want to feel all of it. You have to believe that you're worth saving in order to save yourself. And then you have to forgive yourself for the person you became because you just didn't know any better. So I became very lost to myself, 
But then I found myself, you know, and it took quite a while. And the way I found myself is this. It's a really tough story, but...